Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful, great um, New Year holiday. Uh, it's time to get back into the the stream of things here. Um, the Scientific Roundtable, just kind of a, an update of what's going on. Uh, we did have our pi pilot feasibility program. It's now closed, and those are being reviewed. So thank you for all those that have submitted PNF applications. Um, as a reminder, our next roundtable will be February 5th. Uh, Dr. Bessie from Yale will be uh, talking. The title will be coming out soon. Um, just as kind of updates, there's a new PKD RRC genome browser, which is a repository for variants that affect the polycystins. And so I encourage you guys to, to go up there and take a look at that and screen through the, the browser for information regarding uh, variants that are up there. If you have positions open, please consider using us to advertise those positions anywhere from faculty, postdocs, uh, technical support, whatever you're looking for. Um, please send those to us and we will get them up on the site. Um, some new resources and reagents are coming out. Uh, so please go up to the website, take a look through what we have. If you have questions about particularly junior faculty or, or junior investigators who new to this field that want to, um, you know, get into the PKD field and, and have questions about how to do things, whatever, we're here to help. So please feel free to, to contact us. And, and for those that are on social media, if you want to follow us on X or Twitter or whatever, um, please go and do that. We, we appreciate the uh, feedback and the interactions that we get through that. And so today uh, we can bring down the announcements now. Um, it is a pleasure. Uh, for me to introduce Dr. Kurt Zimmerman, uh, one of the emerging superstars uh, in the PKD field. And I don't just say that because he came out of my group. It is really the truth. Um, he is at the assistant professor at the uh, University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine in the Division of Nephrology. Um, and he is going to uh, enlighten us with a talk on using single cell transcriptomics to study immune cell function in polycystic kidney disease. Kurt, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we look forward to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, let's see. I'll share my screen real quick. Just swap it. Is that a road? There you go. Perfect. All righty. Looks good. So you can uh, you can see it and everything looks good? Yep. Okay, I can't see you guys, but we're just going to go with it. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Terry and Brad. I really appreciate the invitation to speak here today. Um, so today, like Brad mentioned, I'm going to be sharing with you all some of the recent stories that we've generated, some of which is published, some of which is unpublished, whereby we use single cell transcriptomics to study immune cell function in polycystic kidney disease. So I don't think that I need to uh, give too much of an introduction into polycystic kidney di disease to this audience, but I'd just like to highlight that polycystic kidney disease is caused by a variety of different genetic mutations in genes that are required for normal cilia function and formation, and the most common of which that a majority of people in this audience are probably uh, working on are mutations in the PKD1 or PKD2 gene, which cause the autosomal dominant form of polycystic kidney disease, and I think you can see and appreciate how severe um, the the cystic kidneys from these patients are. So just a reminder to everybody kind of um, what we're working with here and why we are uh, in this field. I would also like to highlight that uh, polycystic kidney disease is caused by a variety of other different um, genetic mutations in uh, cilia-related genes, some of which are listed here and some of which are not, but it's uh, considered to be, uh, I think for the most part, a, a ciliopathy. Now, collectively, this disease affects about one in 500 people. And, and as I think everybody in this audience can kind of appreciate that the treatments for polycystic kidney disease are relatively limited in the sense that we only have one FDA approved therapeutic and that is tolvaptin. So I think we can all agree that there are additional treatments that are needed for polycystic kidney disease. 
Now, one of the things that's really interesting about polycystic kidney disease is that the rate of disease progression in these patients is highly variable, even when you have the same underlying genetic mutation. So for example, if you look at uh, data from these two separate manuscripts and you look at the severity of disease as indicated by kidney volume, cyst volume, or height adjusted total kidney volume in the y-axis, and then the age of the patients in the x-axis, you can see here that the patients can be broadly grouped into different subsets. So for example, the ones that I have highlighted here in the red box, you can see that their uh, cyst volume, kidney volume, and height adjusted total kidney volume are increasing really rapidly. So these patients have cystic kidney disease that's progressing really quickly. Now, um, Mariah Razabel and others went on to define these patients based on the male classification system into what we're defining as class 1E patients. So the class 1E patients are the ones that progress really rapidly. In contrast, there's other patients that have mutations in the same gene that uh, progress much more slowly. And I think you can appreciate here that these patients um, shown within the blue box have relatively stable amounts uh, or levels of kidney volume and cyst volume over several years, although I think you can appreciate that these patients do progress to some extent here. Now, if you go back to the male classification system, these patients are referred to as uh, class 1A patients. So I think you can see pretty obviously from this graph that patients can progress at highly variable rates. And if you go and look at the literature over the last several uh, decades, I think the majority of people could agree that there's a variety of factors that can cause the differential rate of cyst growth. So for example, some of the factors that are proposed to influence the rate of cyst growth in patients include the, the gene that is mutated. So we know that PKD1 patients will progress more rapidly than PKD2 patients. Um, the type of genetic mutation, so whether that's a truncating or a missense mutation. The sex of the patient, so males typically will pr progress more rapidly than females. Um, genetic modifiers, so Peter Harris and others have done some really nice work showing that um, genetic modifiers can highly influence the rate of cis progression. And lastly, the one that our lab is most interested in is environmental modifiers. Um, and in particular, we're interested in studying kidney injury. Um, now, I think the majority of data supporting the idea that kidney injury can modify the rate of cyst growth comes from mouse models. And I'm just highlighting two of the several studies here that I think really highlight that um, kidney injury can accelerate the rate of cyst growth, at least in mice. So in these two different studies that I'm showing you here, what we have on the left is uh, work done by Jing Zhao's group in which they showed that if you had a mutated, uh, or if you, if you inducibly deleted the PKD1 gene, followed by performing a ischemia reperfusion injury, you can see that the kidney had much more severe cysts compared to the controls shown here on the left. And similarly, um, data by Dr. Yoder's group um, showed that if you had an IFT88 model, you induced loss of the IFT88 gene in adult mice, and then you gave them injury, you could once again rapidly accelerate the rate of cystic disease. So like I said, I think the majority of data um, supporting that a kidney injury accelerates the rate of cystic disease has come from mice. And what we do in our lab is we use this injury model to recapitulate those patients that have that rapidly progressing disease. So the class 1A patients that I showed you in that previous slide. So one of the, the major interests of our lab, and probably I'd say the major interest of our lab, is trying to understand what is the involvement of the immune cells in slowly and rapidly progressing models of cystic disease. And like I mentioned to you in the previous um, slide, we really think that that injury accelerated model fairly well recapitulates the, the, the patients that have that rapidly progressing disease. Whereas if you induce loss of a ciliary-related gene in adult mice, the disease progresses much more slowly. So we think that model recapitulates the patients that progress at a much slower rate um, in, um, based on the Mayo classification system. So what we do to study immune cell involvement in cystic kidney disease is we take our favorite ciliopathy mouse model. In this case, we take the IFT88 model. So this mouse has um, the exons um, four through seven of the IFT88 gene surrounded by LOXP sites. And this mouse is crossed to a CAG3 promoter. So this is the chicken beta actin promoter driving expression of a, a, a tamoxifen inducible Cree recombinase. So when these mice are six to eight weeks of old age, six to eight weeks of age, we take and give the mice tamoxifen to induce loss of the IFT88 gene and cilia dysfunction. And then three weeks after we induce the mice with tamoxifen, we either give them a 30-minute unilateral ischemia reperfusion injury, followed by harvest and analysis of the kidneys two months post-injury, or we take that mouse and we simply allow it to age out for seven months. Now, importantly, I'd just like to highlight throughout the course of the talk, 
the ones that received the ischemia reperfusion injury, we refer to as the rapidly progressing model. And once again, we uh, are proposing that this model recapitulates at least some of the aspects of that class 1A patients, um, ADPKD patients that I mentioned to you earlier. Furthermore, the one that we do not give injury to, we refer to as the slowly progressing model. Um, and, and that's shown here on the bottom. And just to highlight that when we do these studies in the single cell studies, that any differences we find are not due to differences in cyst severity in these two different models. We went in and we quantified cyst number and cystic severity in these two different models of disease at the two different time points. And we did indeed find that the severity of disease is approximately equal um, between these two models at this time point. Now, we also included a variety of different controls. This includes a, a Cree positive mouse or a cilia mutant mouse that we gave um, tamoxifen to followed by performing a sham surgery. So in this case, instead of clamping off the renal artery in the renal vein, we simply pulled out the kidney, um, let it expose to the air for 30 minutes, and then put it back in. And as you can see here, um, based on the um, cartoon that I'm showing you, these kidneys had very little uh, cystic disease um, at the time point of analysis. We also took a Cree negative mouse. So these mice have normal functional um, primary cilia and kidneys, um, gave these mice tamoxifen, waited three weeks, and then performed once again the IR injury. And we found that two months post-injury, these mice did completely lack, at least histologically, any cyst cystic disease. We also took a Cree negative mouse, gave it tamoxifen, and then allowed it to age for approximately seven months in, in order to account for any of the effects of aging um, that the, the effects of aging might have on the transcriptional signature of immune cells. Now, at the time points that I have listed here, we took digestion, disassociated the tissues, isolated immune cells and all other cells in the kidney, and then performed single cell RNA sequencing and analysis. When we did this, um, we generated what we were referring to as the immune cell atlas of cystic kidney disease. Now, keep in mind that this immune cell atlas is specific um, in this instance for the IFT88 model of disease. But um, when we did this, the, the whole goal of generating this immune cell atlas is trying to understand what's, difference in, what's different in immune cells between the slowly progressing model, when you compare it to the rapidly progressing model, and then the non-cystic mice. So throughout the course of the, the remainder of this talk, the, uh, the different groups will be organized in this order where the, the slowly and the rapidly progressing models are, are shown in red. So the first thing we want to do is identify, well, what are these immune cells? And in order to do this, we used uh, lineage defining markers. So for example, we use CD3E to identify T cells. And for those of you who aren't familiar with UMAPs, I'll be showing quite a few of these um, throughout the course of the talk. The more red, the higher the level of expression. So you can see here very nicely that CD3 um, is expressed fairly abundantly in this cluster of cells shown right here. So based on this marker, we define this subset as T cells and so on and so forth. When we did this, we we're able to identify five different types of immune cells in the kidney include mononuclear phagocytes, which includes macrophages and dendritic cells, T cells, B cells, and neutrophils. Now, one thing I'll highlight is if you look at the broad distribution of immune cell subsets, you can see here that when you glump, uh, group these uh, these immune cells based on their broad markers, you don't really see huge differences between groups. So what we want to do is we really want to define the heterogeneity within these subsets. So we got out our, uh, our magnifying glass and we zoomed into the different clusters of cells. And I'd just like to highlight um, that the first part of the talk is gonna be focused on T cells. And we did this in collaboration with Dr. Katerina Hopp at the University of Colorado in Denver. So like I said, we got out our magnifying glass, we zoomed into the T-cell subset and um, subclustered the T-cells. And when we did this, I think now that you can appreciate that we're able to get a fairly uh, significant amount of heterogeneity between groups. So for example, you can see visually at least that clusters 0, 1, and 4 are enriched in the slowly progressing model, whereas the rapidly progressing model has an enrichment of cluster 3 um, and, and, and slightly a little bit cluster 2 when compared to the slowly progressing model. Now, what we did is we once again went in and used uh, markers or lineage defining markers of each different T cell subsets. And you can see here, we're able to identify um, several different um, adaptive immune cells and, and T cell subsets, as shown here on the right, including CD4 and CD8 T cell subsets. Now, when we went in and we did our quantification of this, we noticed that we had a pretty striking pattern of T cells that were present in each of the different models of disease. So for example, you can see here on, uh, in the slowly progressing model, we had an enrichment of CD8 T cells, CD4 positive T regulatory cells, and then CD4 positive TH17 cells. Whereas in the rapidly progressing model, we had more naive and central memory as well as effector CD4 T cells. 
So anytime you're doing single cell studies, I will highlight this point that you always want to validate your single cell studies via secondary approach. Uh, so what we did is we went in and we devised a gating strategy via flow cytometry to confirm our immune cell uh, single cell data. So what I'm showing you on the top is the gating strategy that we devised to identify all of the different subsets. Well, I shouldn't say all the different subsets. We focused on the top five most abundant ones um, simply due to um, those are the ones that were most significantly different when comparing groups. Suffice it to say, uh, when we went in to a separate cohort of mice and attempted to validate our single cell data, we we're able to validate it for four out of the five clusters, but I will highlight that um, for some reason, we were unable to validate the T regulatory cell cluster was enriched in the slowly progressing model. And uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but um, just suffice it to say, we were able to validate um, four out of the five clusters. So the next question that I think you're probably going to be asking is, well, okay, are they important for cystic kidney disease? So what we did is we went in and we took our IFT88 mouse that I showed you or uh, introduced to you earlier, and we crossed it to a RAG1 deficient background. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, RAG1 deficient mice lack all adaptive immune cells, and this includes both T cells and B cells. However, I will say that we didn't find much difference in the B cell subsets between um, groups. So we think that any of the phenotype that we see in this model is going to be largely driven by T cells. So like I said, we crossed the IFT88 model to the RAG1 deficient background, once again, induced these mice with tafoxifen, and then three weeks later, either gave them um, the injury, and then followed by harvest and analysis two months post-injury, or we simply allowed them to age for about six to seven months, followed by harvest and analysis. When we did this, we got a pretty surprising result, at least to us, is that when we deleted adaptive immune cells, we found that loss of adaptive immune cells significantly restricted cyst growth, but only in the rapidly progressing injury accelerated model. And I think you can see histologically here, it's pretty evident that we had a, a substantial rescue in this group, whereas in the mice that were progressing at a slower rate, we had no effect on the phenotype as shown here on the bottom. So based on this data, um, the, to summarize where we're at at this point, we show that in the slowly progressing model, we're able to identify two cell subsets that were enriched, the CD8 T cells and the TH17 cells. And some, somehow, and uh, quite disappointingly, I think for uh, Dr. Hopp and myself, when we get rid of these cells, we didn't see a, a notable phenotype. In contrast, in the rapidly progressing injury accelerated model, when we got rid of these naive and uh, these naive central memory effector CD4 T cells that were enriched in this model, we saw a substantial reduction in the severity of disease. Now, I think the next question you probably will have is, well, how are these T cells functioning, specifically in the rapidly progressing model, to influence disease progression? So in order to uh, begin to understand how these immune cells are functioning, we, we went to our informatics tool bag and we used this uh, program called NicheNet. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is a program that's similar to the ligand receptor interactions uh, toolkits that have been used in the past, except for it goes one step further in that it not only looks at ligands, uh, produced by a sender cell type as well as receptors produced by a receiver cell type, but it also looks at downstream transcriptional regulators and target genes and how they're differentially expressed between groups. So taking you to our little triad of Im uh, immune cells and, and cystic disease, we think that T cells may either be signaling to macrophages to indirectly influence cyst progression or maybe directly signaling to the cystic epithelium to directly influence cyst progression. So what this software does is it asks, what are the differentially expressed genes in the receiver cell? So in this instance, it could either be the cystic epithelium or the macrophage. What ligands are present in the sender cell, in this case, the T cell that could be explaining these differentially expressed genes? And then it asks, does the receiver cell express the receptor for this ligand? And then it prioritizes the ligands based on how many of the differentially expressed genes in the receiver cell the ligand may explain. So we did a significant amount of computational work, and I'm just showing you the home run slide here in that we compared the rapidly progressing model to the slowly progressing model, looking at interactions between T cells and macrophages and mononuclear phagocytes. And when we did this, uh, and we did a head-to-head -head comparison of these ligands or these predicted ligands, we identified interferon gamma as a ligand produced by T cells in the rapidly progressing model that may be influencing the rate of cystic disease. Uh, furthermore, when we went in and looked at which cell subsets were expressing this via single cell data, we found that the um, 
effector CD4 T cells, which if you may remember were enriched in that rapidly progressing model, had a lot of um, uh, interfering gamma expression. And I will also highlight that um, CD8 T cells do as well. So you can see here that when we uh, validated this via flow cytometry, once again, we found that the effector CD4 T cells produced a lot of interfering gamma as well as the CD8 T cells. So we're not exactly sure um, which one it is, but we think it's the effector CD4 T cells because they were the ones that were enriched in that rapidly progressing model. So now I think the, the home run experiment in this whole mechanistic um, 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 data set is trying to understand, well, is interferon gamma important for injury accelerated disease? So what we did is we crossed our, um, once again, cre ift 88 mouse to interferon gamma deficient mouse, followed by performing injury and harvesting analysis 56 days or two months post that initial injury. And quite, uh, quite happily for us and quite excitingly, I should say, is that in our CRE-positive ift 88 mouse that received the kidney injury, in this instance, we did folic acid injury, um, we can see here that on the bottom, loss of interferon gamma substantially reduced the severity of cystic kidney disease compared to the controls on the top. Um, and this is bore out in the quantification on the right, whereby you can see that kidney weight, body weight, cystic index, cyst size, and number of cysts is all substantially reduced in the uh, interferon gamma deficient mice. Furthermore, when we went on to look at fibrosis and kidney function, we saw a similar trend whereby loss of interferon gamma in the cre ift 8 mice substantially reduced the, uh, or significantly, I should say, reduced the amount of fibrosis and improved or uh, improved kidney function as evidenced by reduced BUN. So to summarize the first part of my talk, we have found that interferon gamma T cells um, promote injury accelerated cystic kidney disease. So bringing you back to our immune cell atlas, the whole goal in the, uh, of my lab is to understand how all different types of immune cells are involved in this process. And in particular, our lab is really interested in understanding how macrophages or mononuclear phagocytes are involved in this process. So we went back in and once again, got out our magnifying glass and zoomed in this time on the mononuclear phagocytes. When we do our subclustering uh, of the MMPs, I think um, once again, similar to what I showed you with the T cell subsets, I think we can appreciate that the uh, MMP subsets are different when you compare the solely and rapidly progressing models, not only to one another, but to the non-cystic controls here. And I've actually gone in in this one and highlighted the uh, two cell subsets that are really different between the two different models. So um, you can see here that the rapidly progressing model had an enrichment of cluster six, which we identified as dedifferentiated kidney resident macrophages based on the absence uh, of certain classical KRM markers, as well as um, we identified this MRC1 positive KRM cluster, which is cluster four um, being enriched in the slowly progressing model. Now, um, down here on the bottom, this is just quantification of the single cell RNA sequencing data, highlighting to, uh, highlighting to you what I mentioned just previously, where each of these clusters is very significantly enriched in their respective models. So next, we want to once again validate our single cell RNA sequencing data. So we devised a gating strategy to identify the dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages. And um, suffice it to say, this is the gating strategy shown here on the top. We identified all cells expressing F480 and CD64. And then we actually identified these dedifferentiated macrophages based on the absence of CD11C. And we did this because um, in adult mice, um, the majority of kidney resident macrophages express CD11C. And um, we see via single cell transcriptomics and some other uh, data that we published that these dedifferentiated macrophages do not express CD11C. So the next thing we did uh, using this gating strategy is we went into our rapidly progressing model and we quantified the, um, the number of these dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages. And I think once again, you can see visually looking at this fax plot in the upper left that the number of these dedifferentiated KRMs were significantly increased in the rapidly progressing model compared to the control IR group. Now, for these experiments, the, the control IR group, these are the, the normal cilia wild type mice that received the injury. Uh, furthermore, when we went on to quantify this data, shown here in the bottom, we found that the, the uh, number of these dedifferentiated KRMs were significantly increased in the rapidly progressing model compared to the control um, at uh, beginning seven days post-injury. Now, this is important because in this model specifically, we see the first onset of cysts beginning around 14 days post-injury. So you can see here that the, uh, the, the increase in these dedifferentiated KRMs began on day seven, which is prior to the onset of disease, suggests um, that they may be uh, promoting cyst progression and possibly initiation. 
So next up, we want to test, well, what's the functional importance of this cell type? So um, in, a, in a significant amount of data that I'm not going to be showing you today, we mechanistically showed that um, following injury in this rapidly progressing model, they upregulate the membrane bound form of CSF1, which binds to the CSF1 receptor on the resonant macrophage, drives their self proliferation and the accumulation of dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages. So in order to target the signaling axis in cystic kidney disease, we use this GW2580 compound, which specifically uh, inhibits and blocks CSF1R kinase signaling in those kidney resonant macrophages. So in theory, we'd predict that giving them this GW2580 compound would prevent the accumulation of the dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages. So what we did is in the rapidly progressive model, indeed, we used this compound, and then we analyzed the number of macrophages at three days post-injury. And uh, happily for us, we found that treatment of these mice with GW2580 did significantly reduce the, uh, uh, the number of dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages while leaving total kidney resonant macrophages unaffected. Furthermore, when we went on to look at the histology and the severity of disease, we found that these dedifferentiated macrophages promoted cis progression as deletion of this cell type, or specific deletion of this cell type, rescued the phenotype. So uh, to summarize the second part of my talk, we find that dedifferentiated kidney resonant macrophages promote injury-accelerated cystic kidney disease. So bringing you back to our um, single cell transcriptomics data set that I've uh, shared with you, um, we show that this cluster right here promotes the disease. So the next thing we want to know is, well, what's the importance of this um, cluster four, which is enriched in the slowly progressing model? So first, we want to go in and um, one, validate that the slowly progressing model had more of these um, um, MRC1 or CD206 positive resident macrophages via flow cytometry. And then we want to test the number of these cells in multiple models to see if these MRC1 macrophages are accumulating just in the IFT88 model, or if this is a broader trend in other um, models of disease. So once again, we went in, we used flow cytometry to identify the MRC1 positive kidney resonant macrophages using the CD206 marker. And when we did this, we used two different models of slowly progressing cystic disease. Um, we are working on doing more models at the current time, but um, at the, at the current moment, we use the IFT88 model, so the slowly progressing model I've been talking about throughout the time course, as well as the PKD1RCRC model. The rapid models, we used um, three different IFT88 models, so some are injured, some are non-injured, as well as an injured PKD2 model. And the summary of all this data is shown here on the right, whereby we group the number of MRC1 kidney resonant macrophages based on how fast the disease is progressing. And what we're finding is that the number of MRC1 KRMs is significantly increased in the two models of slowly progressing disease compared to all of the rapidly progressing models. And this occurs um, despite the fact that I will say there is a slight difference in kidney weight body weight, um, but I I think you can appreciate that the full change between these two is much higher for the number of MRC1 KRM. So we really think that the MRC1 KRM are, are enriched in the uh, slowly progressing model. So one of the questions is how, how do we go about targeting the MRC1 KRM? And um, one of the interesting things that we observed when we did the uh, single cell RNA sequencing studies is that if we analyze the top differentially expressed genes in the MRC1 KRM subset, which as a reminder is shown up here, we found that one of the top differentially expressed genes was TREM2. And um, knowing, uh, being a macrophage biologist and reading the macrophage literature, this immediately set off some alarm bells in my head from some uh, paper published by Edua Meats Group in 2017. And in this seminal paper, they uh, showed that a TREM2 positive DAM or disease associated microglia, I'm not just swearing out here for no reason, but these TREM2 positive DAMs accumulated in Alzheimer's disease model and were TREM2 dependent. So for example, what, you sh what I'm showing you up here, this is a homeostatic mouse that has normal TREM2. You can see that the microglia are all in the homeostatic microglia cluster. In the Alzheimer's disease model, you can see that the microglia shift their signature towards the stage 2 dam or TREM2 positive dam. And then in the absence of TREM2, you no longer got accumulation of these stage 2 dams or TREM2 dams. So this led to the idea that we could specifically and significantly prevent the accumulation of those TREM2-like kidney resonant macrophages using TREM2-deficient mice.
or the MRC1 positive using TREM2 deficient mice. So what we did is we went in and we took our IFT88 model and we crossed to either wild type or TREM2 deficient mice, induced these mice with tamoxifen, and then allowed them to age for seven months to see what the phenotype was. Quite interesting for us when we did this analysis, um, I kept getting these notifications in my email inbox about mice dying. And I was like, okay, this is strange. I don't understand why these mice will be dying at about five months post induction. They should not be doing this. And when we went in and we stratified them based on uh, uh, genotype, you could, you could see here that about a third of all the mice that lack TREM2 and TREM2-like macrophages were succumbing to the disease beginning about five to six months post induction. Of interest, if you take and you analyze the mice that did make it to the endpoint of the analysis, we find that the severity of disease was significantly increased in the mice lacking the TREM2 macrophages, um, uh, suggesting that the TREM2 macrophages, at least in the IFT88 model of slowly progressing disease, may restrict cis progression. Um, so, and, and to summarize this, uh, the TREM2 macrophages that we identified in that slowly progressing model, at least in the IFT88 uh, model of cystic disease, seem to be restricting cyst growth. So um, the, the last part that I'm, I'm going to real briefly talk about is we've showed you all these different macrophage subsets and what's, which one is one or map both of these macrophage signatures present in ADPKD patients. So which one seems to more faithfully recapitulate the human disease. So in order to begin to address this question, what we did is we went and utilized the um, data set that um, uh, Dr. Yoshi Muto and Dr. Humphrey's group at um, WashU produced, where they did single cell RNA sequencing on ADPKD patients. And what we did is we took, just as a, a proof of principle, we took two of the genes that were most significantly enriched in those dedifferentiated macrophages, which once again, those are the ones that I showed you promoted the disease progression, as well as two of the genes that were most enriched in the TREM2 macrophage group, which once again, those are the ones I showed restricted the disease progression. And we asked, where were they being expressed? And how specifically were they to the PKD2 model? And I think you can appreciate that if you look at two of the genes most enriched in the slowly progressing model, you can see here that if you look at the leukocytes, which are immune cells, that there wasn't a consistent trend with both of those genes where one went up in PKD and then one went down in PKD. Now, in contrast, if we looked at the TREM2 macrophage signature uh, genes, so that's TREM2 and MRC1, we saw both uh, that in both uh, of these genes contexts, we saw that um, the expression of this gene was significantly increased in leukocytes very, very specifically, and was significantly increased in the PKD compared to control leukocytes. So I think these data strongly suggest that that TREM2 signature that we identified um, in the slowly progressing model is found also in ADPKD patients. Furthermore, we went back to ADPKD uh, kidney tissue, and we did some flow cytometry analysis um, um, looking at um, CD206 expression in ADPKD patients. And when we did this, we found that the number of AD or the number of CD206 positive or TREM2 positive um, kidney resident macrophages was significantly increased in ADPKD patients um, compared to the controls. And furthermore, um, Dr. Zhang Li and Brad's group did some um, confocal staining, and they found that the CD206 positive or TREM2-like macrophages were found in cystic regions of ADPKD patients shown here on the bottom, but they were not um, significantly accumulating in non-cystic areas of ADPKD patients. So these data suggest that those TREM2 macrophages not only are accumulating in ADPKD patients, but they're also accumulating in cystic regions to, uh, uh, we think, influence the rate of cyst growth, and in particular, we think to um, restrict the rate of growth. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, finish by um, thanking my lab. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Sarah Miller, as well as Isabella Darby, who led a lot of the TREM2 studies. And um, we also have quite a bit of TREM2 data that um, we're, we're currently working on in this area. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Clissa Ahmed and Morgan Smith, who did a lot of the work in the T-cell uh, paper, as well as Dr. Cheng Song um, in Brad's group when I worked with him um, back there. Um, so I'd like to thank all of them for all their help in that. I'd also like to thank Dr. Zhang Li, who I mentioned to you, uh, is, is currently in Brad's group and helped with a lot of the studies throughout this uh, entire project. Furthermore, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hop at UC Denver, who uh, I work with on the T-cell study, Dr. Florent Guinot at uh, Gustave Rossi 
who uh, is a, a close collaborator and friend in the macrophage biology field. Um, and then I'd like to thank some uh, collaborators at Ohio State University, Dr. Kin Ma and Anjun Ma, who um, we're currently working on developing a cross model and species atlas of immune cells in cystic disease to try to understand how those immune cells in ADPKD patients correlate to the immune cells in mice. And those are some projects that um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you the data today just because it's a little preliminary, but um, we're really excited about some of the findings that we're getting there. And then lastly, um, uh, I'd like to thank, I'd also like to thank Brad. I shouldn't leave that one out uh, specifically because he's hosting, but uh, thank you very much, Brad, for all the support over the years. Um, and then last, I'd like to thank um, the current funding sources, including uh, the NIDDK, PKD Foundation, and uh, uh, Presbyterian Health Foundation. With that, I'd be happy to uh, take on any questions or um, have any uh, discussion about immune cells in PKD. So thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask them directly. I'd like to get conversations started if we could. And I'm going to start off, Kurt, with the interferon gamma knockout mice. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So with the rapidly progress mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um so the juveniles also have juvenile induced mutants also have rapid cyst release are those rescued by the interferon gamma or are they also class 1e e type phenotypes or is that something completely different do you think <clears throat> well uh we're kind of hoping it is that's that's kind of the paradigm is that we think that we can uh, uh stratify models uh based on how fast they're progressing um, now, the, obviously, the question is injury versus no injury and rapid progression. How is the mechanism of uh, immune-mediated progression similar? Is it similar between the two or not? Um, long story short, we haven't done those. We have those uh, studies proposed in the grant that we're submitting um, very soon. So that, I think, is going to be a very important um, study to see like you mentioned, is it just the rate of the disease progression or is it something specific to the injury itself? So um, I don't have an answer for that. That's something that um, we're, we're definitely looking at as well. Okay. Went up for questions, please. Hi, uh, Blake Lee. here from uh, Rogerson. Uh, very enjoyable talk, great data. I'm curious, um, are you anticipating that there are cell autonomous effects of IFT88 in inflammatory and, and you know, T cells and B cells? Yeah, so I get this question, I think pretty much every time I, I give this talk. Um, to, to answer your question in a short manner, in, in uh, macrophages, not really, no. We've, uh, we spent quite a bit of time looking for IFT88, um, cilia, anything um, IFT88 related in macrophages, we've never found it. I am aware that there is um, um, some literature that may report that monocytes may have cilia. We've never been able to find it. Um, I, I, in talking to the, the macrophage and immunology community, I don't think anybody there has been able to find it. So in macrophages, I'd say no. Now, T cells is a different story because there's the whole uh, endosomal recycling of the TCR. And in, 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 in um, T cells, there's definitely an effect of, of loss of IFTD. Now, I will I will say that in our model that we use, the, the, the CAG IFT88 model, interestingly enough, this isn't something I've never published, but this is something I found, is that if you induce mice with tamoxifen at day zero and you look three weeks later, all the T cells that lacked IFT88 in the T cell are gone. And all the T cells that are remaining in the kidney are wild type. And the number is not different between a control or a mutant. So it doesn't seem to affect their number. It just affects their survival. And it doesn't seem to affect their subsets. We've done very extensive characterization and we have not found any difference in subsets. But yeah, if you lack if you lack IFTD in T cells, um, you, you definitely have an effect on the T cell itself, but those cells are gone in our model. Now, I know other people have also looked at um, other IFT genes and T cells, and they've saw that it affects thymocyte differentiation and, and survival of those cells. So yeah, in T cells there is, in B cells, I have no idea. We've never really looked at B cells. We're uh, kind of scared of B cells. So we don't, uh, we don't really go into the B cell world in our, in our lab, um, but uh, I can only comment on the T cells and the macrophage, so our monocytes. Is there any way to do a cell type specific knockout there? Of the of IFT88 in the macrophage? Or, or yeah, T -cells or, or would you need to like immunoablate and then? Yeah, yeah. There's there's okay. lots of ways that we could look at it. Uh, we have tons of macrophage crees in our colony that we could, um, if we're interested, knock out those in in that cell type. Um, like I said, um, 
we never really found them in the macrophage, so we weren't too worried about that. And in the, the, the T cells, we did see them, but because they're all recycled and back to wild type, we don't really think we're studying in right. our models, at least cell autonomous or cell intrinsic defects of IFT88 or cilia. We think it's all um, uh, driven by the immune cells, not within the immune cells. Oh, cool. thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi, this is Zhugui. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm Chigui from Dr. Betsy Lab at Yale. And yeah, very, very interesting talk. And I think your the rapidly grow, grow progressing model is pretty useful for, for us. So my question is that for this uh, rapidly progressing models, what, uh, what is the prevalence of this kind of phenotype in patients? Or oh, on the other hand, uh, let's say at the end of the day, you have a very promising target. And what kind of patients in the clinical, they should use your new targets for the treatment? Uh, you're, you're talking with regard to the rapidly progressing model? Yes. Well, I think um, this I think this kind of is, is in the same realm as what Brad was asking, but I think in, in, in an ideal world that we would view, we would view that anything that was involved in the rapidly progressing model in mice should be more relevant to the, the rapidly progressing patients. Um, now, there's some caveats to this because we don't fully know whether the, the observed effects we see in our rapidly progressing model are dependent on injury or not. Um, and we also don't know, um, at least to my knowledge, if ADPKD patients that are progressing really rapidly, if that's driven by either a clinical or subclinical injury. So unfortunately, those studies are not um, done, to my knowledge, at least. And um, we're not entirely sure about that. But I think in our in our broader uh, view of immune, immune cell involvement in PKD, we, we would predict and hope that immune cells that are accumulating in our rapidly progressing models would be more more uh, applicable to the rapidly progressing patients and, and vice versa for the slowly progressing models. Although, like I said, that is uh, dependent on the caveat that injury accelerate disease recapitulates faithfully what you observe in the rapidly progressing patients, which I'm not, like I said, I can't, can't say that for sure, but that's kind of like, I think like our, our uh, golden view of things. Arlene. Yeah. yeah cool. Hi. Thank that's you. a great talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. You know, um, we've struggled a little bit with wondering whether or not the PKD mutations in the macrophages in patients are playing a role, mm -hmm. right? So it, it comes down to sort of specificity of why is this happening? And so do you see the same resident macrophages in other kidney diseases playing a um, role? Is it the the ones that I found in... in Mm -hmm. in the single cell. Um, yeah. So in, so actually we did some stuff, uh, some studies with uh, Dr. Jim George, who's a, a new pomogrel at UAB. So we did find mm -hmm. that in ischemic injury, we get that same accumulation of de-differentiated macrophages. Um, we kind of think they're involved in repair in that. Um, and the, there is also um, some evidence out there that the TREM2 macrophages accumulate in other slowly progressive models of kidney disease. We have a paper under review at uh, Immunity right now, looking at the role of TREM2 macrophages in diabetic kidney disease. So um, it, it's, I think it's, and I was actually just at the, the monocyte macrophage conference in Europe. And I think the, the prevailing paradigm is that these TREM2 max and these de-differentiated macrophages are likely gonna be present in a variety of different um, tissues and a variety of different disease models. So I think we're all kind of studying the same thing when we study immune cells. It's just everybody names them a little bit differently. Um, everybody talks about them a little bit differently. So us immunologists are really bad about giving them like uh, uh, sub names. So we call them like CAMs or cyst associated macrophages. Edo's group calls them DAMs. Charlotte's group yeah. calls them LAMs and, and so on and so forth. But yes, they are present in other models of kidney disease, um, definitely. So, so one of the things that, I don't know if this is feasible or not, but if you were to mutate the PKD genes in your monocytes or your macrophages, it's, would they be different? Yeah, so that's that's definitely feasible. Sorry, I forgot to address that. In, uh, um, but it's a good question. So when you go to the IFT88 data, um, we've never really found IFT88 in, in macrophages, not no cilia, anything like that. But if you go and look at PKD1 or PKD2, it is certainly expressed in macrophages. Um, now, interestingly enough, 
I don't really have a great answer. I can tell you that the studies are feasible. And I can also tell you that when we were at the uh, most recent FASAB in Lisbon, Portugal, there is a group in Europe that's, that's studying um, the effects of, of PKD1 mutations intrinsically in the monocytes and the macrophages. And if I remember correctly, which I may be misremembering, I think they show that they're more pro-inflammatory when they had the PKD1 mutations, and that's independent of all external environments because they, the, they took the monocytes out of the, the, the blood and they put them in culture and then they stimulated them in culture and they showed that the PKD1s, I believe, had a greater response or, or things like that uh, produce more inflammatory cytokines. So I do think that there is some role for PKD1 or PKD2 intrinsically in the macrophage um, and, 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 and possibly in the T cells as well. But um, yeah, those, those studies are feasible. We just haven't done them. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Oliver. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So you only go for the, you only talked about the macrophages which are upregulated, but if you look at your graph, the, the general tissue resident macrophages are actually downregulated in your PKD model. So can you explain this all by just transdifferentiation into the other macrophages or is there actually a general loss of kidney resident macrophages in your model? Um, so if you quantify numbers, we don't see a huge shift in total resident macrophages, it's more of that transdifferentiation. I will say that's not the case in all kidney diseases. So we've done some work in um, some ischemic models and acute kidney injury models. And we do see that in those instances, you get a transdifferentiation of macrophage from one subset to another, which is also coupled with a general loss. Um, but in our model, um, we we don't see that, ex that extreme effect on the resident macrophage number. So there's, there's, there's maybe some slight shifts, but the, the quiescent kidney resident macrophage numbers, we, we still see, if you look at pure numbers, actually still go up in the, the, the disease model. Um, uh, maybe transcriptionally, you get that kind of like what you're referring to, you get a, a subset or you get a switching of the subsets and the, the quantification of cluster abundance may shift. So one goes up, the other naturally goes down. Um, but if you look at pure numbers and sorted um, kidneys, you, you, you don't really see that decrease. So I, I think in our instance, in this model, I think that the phenotypic effects that we're observing, or at least I predict, are driven by a switching of the subsets and not really like you get one subset and the other one goes away. Um, so that one I think is fairly stable, whereas we're getting that trans differentiation. Because your cluster zero really went down. In, in, in your yeah, I mean, in, in single cell data, it can do that because it's a proportion. Um, but like I said, when you look at absolute numbers and uh, 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 cell numbers and via flow cytometry, we don't see that huge loss of quiescent, the, the homeostatic cluster zero, we don't see that big loss. We actually went in and did that in the paper and uh, it, 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 it's not that, I think it's just a, a, a kind of an artifact of the proportions, um, so to speak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right, Kurt, I want to thank you again for a wonderful talk. Um, we normally end this by asking, you know, as, as a consortium that is responsible for production of reag reagents resources to advance research, whether there is anything that you would like to see us as a consortium think about, develop, whatever, that would help you promote your research activity? Yeah, uh, definitely. One thing I would say for me is if uh, you guys can make a single cell atlas of immune cells across <laughs> models and species that would be terrific or at least an 80 well, i thought you were doing that aren't you doing that <laughs> well it's uh if we could uh, get some collaborators to do the single cell immune atlas that would be uh for us like because we have all these we have all these different mouse models right we have the ifts the pkd1s the pkd2s the pkd1 rcs and i think for us one thing that we're kind of racking our brains over is trying to understand which of these mouse models is most best recapitulates the human disease, at least immunologically speaking. Um, so I think for us, if we could have that reference data set, that would be hugely useful for us. Now, I know Dr. Humphreys did uh, the single nuclear seek, but unfortunately for immunologists, the nuclear seek doesn't work great for immune cells. Um, so we really need like an immune focused um, single cell atlas of PKD. Um, <laughs> so for us, that would be very useful. And unfortunately, we don't have the, the clinical resources where I'm at to, to really do that. So uh, if you guys are interested in collaborating. Yeah, I mean, those would be things that would be part of like a, an RFA in the pilot feasibility program too, that we could promote. So yeah, no, those are things that we will take under consideration. Absolutely. Okay. All right. 
Uh, with that, I again want to thank Kurt for a wonderful talk. Um, thank you for attending. And the next one, I think, I don't have it here. I think it's February 5th. Is that correct? Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. February 5th, um, Dr. Bessie from Yale will be presenting. So we look forward to seeing you all again. Um, and uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate Thanks, Brad. Yep.